What's going on, e-learning human geographers? This is Mr. Majewski. We're going to be covering one of my favorite units, political geography, this week. We're going to spend a few weeks on it. Uh, this is technically week one of political, so we're going to get right into it. Political geography, first a definition for you. It's the study of the location and organization of the Earth's surface into political units. So it's essentially studying uh, the distribution of people around the Earth according to how they um, identify politically, how they divide politically, uh, how they represent themselves politically. Um, and the basis for political geography is the idea of a state. A state is another word for a country. All right. In 1800, there were 134 sovereign states or sovereign countries. But by 1914, so about 100 years later, we were cut in half. We were down to only 64. Uh, and many of those that existed during that time also had large empires. Um, so the number of states reduced to between 18 and 1900, but the size of the empires actually grew, the size of their possessions. In 1950, so not that long ago, there were still only about 60 countries worldwide. And by that point, it was the U.S. and the Soviet Union that were the two powers. Only 60 countries in 1950. If you compare that with today, we're back up to 197. We have more today than we have at any point in the last few hundred years. Um, 197 that are officially part of the UN. So again, we started with hundreds in the 1800s. Then, because of events that occurred in history, we reduced the number of countries down to 60 um, in the early 1900s. And now we're back up to almost 200 again today. So a lot has happened. Uh, to cause those numbers. And, and here's a nice little look. Here's the map of the world in 1800. You have 134 countries. Um, yes, you have some countries like Spain uh, that have started to create overseas empires. But for the most part, right, um, countries do not have large overseas possessions in 1800. Uh, by 1914, like, right, look at the world. Um, it was really controlled by European states. Uh, and there were really only about 60 that existed worldwide. And by the early 1900s, you know, look at England as an example here, right? There's, uh, there's the United Kingdom. Look, they possess Canada. They have possessions all over Africa, India, South Asia, Australia, East Asia. And that's just England alone, right? Look at France, right? Look at all the African possessions. They have possessions in Southeast Asia, in East Africa, in South America. So the whole point here is fewer countries with large, large uh, colonial empires. Yeah, and again, we'll get into some of the reasons why as part of this presentation. Today, 197 countries, right? So those empires have been gotten rid of. Uh, and instead, we have essentially independent states all over the world, um, almost 200 of them. Now, there's disagreement. Some people, if you ask them, say that we actually already have more than 200 countries or states. Uh, and it really comes down to your viewpoint and your perspective. Let me give you some examples. You know, Palestinians consider their home to be a state, right? And uh, Israel doesn't. So do we consider Palestine a separate state from Israel? Uh, the Palestinians want us to, the Israelis don't, right? If you do, then technically we have one more country in the world. If you don't, then obviously we do not count an extra one. What about North Korea, right? Technically, North and South Korea are at war, and they both claim that they're trying to unite into one Korea. Um, so is North and South Korea, do we consider them separate states from one another, or is there just one Korea, for instance? What about Taiwan, right? Remember, Taiwan is technically considered independent by the United States, but China still considers Taiwan its own possession. Right? If we count Taiwan as an independent country, it goes on the list, right? Um, and that would obviously affect uh, the total number that exists around the world. All right? So the whole point here is um, there's disagreement as to how many actual states there are. The UN says there's 197. Some people argue that maybe there are actually more that are not officially recognized by the UN. So what does it take? Thank you. So what does it take to be a country? Uh, if you want to become a state, what do you need to do? Well, there's actually a checklist, all right? Um, and here's what you need. One, um, you have to have space or territory, 
which is internationally recognized as your boundaries. So the rest of the world needs to essentially uh, acknowledge that there is space or territory in the world that belongs to your country and your country alone. Secondly, you have people who live there permanently, all right? Uh, there have to be people who are on there at all times, all right? Um, three, you have to have sovereignty, right? Which means uh, you control your own destiny and no other state has power over you, all right? Four, you have to have recognition externally. That essentially means other countries recognize that you deserve to be a country as well. Essentially, the state has been voted into the club by all of the other states. Yes, we agree, you do deserve to be a state and we are going to negotiate with you as if you are. And then finally, they have a government in place. Uh, that government is used for security, safety, and services uh, to help regulate the economy and trade. All right, so for any country to be uh, officially considered a state, it has to have those things. Space and territory with recognized boundaries, people, right, that live there permanently, sovereignty over their own decisions, right, no other state has power over them, external recognition where the rest of the world or a large number of the rest of the world uh, acknowledge that you have a right to be a country, and then um, you have a, a government in place, right, that is managing your affairs. Now, hey, size doesn't matter, all right? Um, there are some countries that have small land areas, but they're still states because they fit the criteria above. In fact, we call some of those microstates. Good example is in Europe. Uh, you know, the microstate of Liechtenstein is smaller than New Jersey in the United States. Shoot, Monaco, that little state right there down in southern Europe between France and Italy, uh, it's actually smaller than Anaheim in, to in terms of total land area. It's only 0.6 square miles large, and it's its own country. So again, size doesn't matter. Those other requirements do. Now, we've already talked about some of these uh, terms, but again, nationality is the country that you belong to. Many countries allow dual identity, like the United States, all right? Um, so if you're an American citizen, all right, the United States, uh, uh, you, your nationality is American, all right? Territory is a piece of land that's legally connected or attached to a state. All righty. Um, so territory usually means land that is connected or attached to a state, but not officially part of the country. City-states. Hey, uh, city-states are really like the very earliest states were really just cities, all right? They formed in places like Athens and Mesopotamia and Rome. Uh, and a city would grow and its surrounding farmland and the city itself would simply be called the city-state. Oftentimes, city-states would ally together uh, to form larger states, uh, and they often would clash with one another, another over regional or local matters. Uh, the earliest ancient empires, so the Greeks, the Romans, the Mesopotamians, were actually started as city-states um, that grew outward and expanded power and eventually became empires, okay? Self-determination is when people in a country get to vote for their own government or leaders. Uh, usually this is associated with democracy, right? Um, Self-determination is something that the United States considers very important and valuable. We want people around the world to have a choice over who their leaders are. No matter who they choose, we want them to have that choice. We want them to have self-determination. Hey, really quickly, uh, differences between nation and state. I think this is a nice little video, so we're going to go ahead and watch it now. All right, so let's watch it together. A feature of the nation. Whereas a nation becomes... Welcome to this new tutorial. Today, we are going to talk about state and nation and the differences between the state and nation. Nation means a historically constituted stable community of the people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. Okay, so again, I want to point out to you, a nation is a group of people, right? Um, so, and they, and they share these common features with one another. According to Blanche Shelley, nation is a union of masses of men, 
bound together specially by language and customs into common civilization which gives them a sense of unity therefore a nation is a culturally homogeneous social group whereas excellent right so culturally homogeneous social group already is a nation the state is a people organized for a law within the definite territory it is always sovereign supreme internally and independent externally now let us understand the distinction between the state and nation first nation and state are distinct entities the nation may not be always a state example india was not a state before august 1947 on the other hand a state may not always be a nation example austria hungary was a state but not a nation before world war 1 because the heterogeneous people did not form a culturally homogeneous people second the state is a state because it is sovereign the nation is not a state if it is not sovereign sovereignty is the chief characteristic of a state it is not a feature of the nation whereas a nation becomes a nation state when the nation attain statehood next the state is political concept while the nation is cultural and a psychological body nation is primarily cultural and only incidentally political in short nation is not political concept it is only spiritual next laws bind the people together in a state whereas sentiments and emotions binds the people in a nation to put it in simple words the unity of a state is always external whereas the unity of a nation is always eternal well in the case of a state unity is imposed it comes from above through laws whereas in the case of a nation unity comes from within through emotions mm. next there is an element of force connected with the state the state laws are binding there is a coercion exercised by the state if its authority is defied whereas in the case of the nation there is the element of persuasion next the elements of the state are definite the element of the states are population fixed territory government and sovereignty whereas the elements of the nation are not definite examples somewhere common language help constitute a nation whereas somewhere else common race make a nation and last a state may be larger than a nation the former ussr had within it more than 100 nationalities conversely a nation may be larger than a state a nationality may spread over two states and the example is the korean nationality is spread over two states north korea and south korea awesome really i hope that you have a video one. there i got to tell you guys so we're going to come right back to the slides there i think he did a really nice job of explaining the differences they're not as easy as you might think all right okay so we talked about nation states there i wanted to give you some examples of those um that exist today uh remember nation states are states where essentially the boundaries of the states correspond almost identically to the boundaries of a nationality um so we're looking for states that essentially have one or almost just one uh entire nationality within their boundaries so let me give you some examples japan and iceland are usually the most well known um albania is in southern europe uh the vast majority of the population is ethnically albanian 98.6% of the population belongs to one nationality yeah that's definitely a nation state right only about 1% of the population does not belong to that particular group so the boundaries of the state pretty much exactly correspond with the boundaries of the albanian nationality 
uh, Bangladesh uh, in Asia. Again, the vast majority of the Bangladesh uh, of Bangladesh are Bengali people, um, and that they comprise ninety eight percent of the population. Um, so again, one nationality uh, making up almost ninety eight percent of the country. Iceland. Again, uh, the inhabitants are technically related to other Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Norway, Finland, but the national culture and language are so unique and only found in Iceland. There's no cross-border minorities. The, the lands are just too far away from Iceland, this island, uh, and so all you have are this Icelandic people. All right, And then Japan. Uh, again, isolated by ocean, so Japan is traditionally seen as an example of a nation state, also the largest. It's got 120 million people in it, uh, and about 97 to 98 percent are Japanese. All right, so again, we are not a nation state in the United States. We're the exact opposite, right? Pretty much large countries um, like the uh, former USSR, the United States, Canada, India, uh, these countries tend to have... Um, kind are not nation states. I'll put it to you that way. All right. Okay. Some of these other uh, terms that we covered last week, we want to get some examples of them as well. We're going to start with stateless nation, and we're going to give you a few examples: the Chechens, the Kurds, the Palestinians. Maybe should they be considered? I think so. And then multi-state nation. We're going to use the Kurds again as an example. We're going to look at a multinational state like the United Kingdom and Yugoslavia. And then last, we're going to finish with some autonomous or semi-autonomous regions like Hong Kong and Native American reservations. All right, so stateless nation. We're going to start with Chechnya, all right, as a great example. You need to have an example of this in your minds. Uh, so use one of these. Chechnya is a region in the Caucasus. Now, the Caucasus is part of southern Russia. It's, it's in southern Asia. I should say Central Asia. Look at all of these nationalities and ethnicities that are clustered together here. Uh, technically, all of this land right here, all right, it belongs to Russia. Um, but you'll see all these ethnicities that are clustered together in this one region called the Caucasus. So, Chechnya is located right there, where my arrow is at, that light brown country in the midst of the Caucasus. It is a mix, this region, of languages. It is a mix of religions and ethnicities. Like most of the ethnicities here, the people that live in this area, Chechnya, right, consider themselves to be their own separate nationalities. And some have called to create an independent country called Chechnya. They would like to break away from Russia, which is who they belong to. These people believe they are a stateless nation, the Chechens, living under the Russian state. They've resisted Russian troops. They've resisted Russian police. They have used terror and extremism to try to convince the Russians to let them leave. Similarly, we have other ethno-nationalist movements that have happened in nearby Dagestan and also in North and South Ossetia. So, a lot of ethno-nationalism in this region. A lot of these folks are ethnicities living in the Soviet or in Russia. Uh, and they believe that they ought to, as a stateless nation, be granted independence, and they're fighting for that presently. So this region, right, and the Chechens in particular, are a great example of a stateless nation fighting against a power, in this case, Russia. Another great example is the Kurds, all right? The Kurds are an ethnic group that is spread over much of the Middle East. They are spread over six different countries. They are not a majority in any of those countries. They are an ethnic minority. They believe that they ought to be granted a homeland and that territory from these countries ought to be taken and turned into a new country called Kurdistan uh, and that that should become their nation state. All right. Um, the Kurds are probably the most famous example of a stateless nation, and they are a stateless nation that has gotten a lot of attention lately. By the way, they're also a multi-state nation because they are spread out over more than one state, uh, in this case, over six of them. So first, we've got a couple of videos to watch. I'm going to start with the first one here. Who are... In Iraq right now, the Sunni militant group ISIS is fighting against the Shiite-run government for control of most of the country. But those aren't the only groups in Iraq. There's a whole other group of people known as the Kurds who have their own security force and their own autonomous region and government. So who are the Kurds and what do we know about them? 
Let's start by looking at a map of Iraq. The Kurds live in this area, which makes them seem like a small group, but if you pull back, you see that the Kurdish people actually live across a large continuous block of the Middle East. Mmm, stateless nation, multi-state nation. That spreads across Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. It's commonly known as Kurdistan. There are anywhere from 15 to 20 million Kurds living in this area with their own language and culture, and about 4 million of those are living in Iraq. Okay, so language, culture similarities, religious uh, differences between the area, right? So definitely they view themselves as a distinct, separate national... Kurds by religion are Sunni Muslims, but they existed prior to Islam, and they were resistant to the Arab military expansion that took place in the 6th century. In order to create the first Sunni caliph all those years ago, Arab forces had to defeat many different Kurdish princes and feudal groups. So as a result, Kurds don't self-identify as Arabs the way that most Sunnis and Shias do. Again, this all started in the 6th century, and to say the least, modern history has not been kind to the Kurds. In 1920, the Ottoman Empire fell, which resulted in the Treaty of Sèvres. This formed the nations of Iraq, Syria, and Kuwait, and it was supposed to leave the option open for a Kurdish nation. But that didn't happen, largely because Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iraq refused to recognize Kurdish independence. Ever since then, they've been a marginalized group stuck in those nations, and they faced a lot of persecution and oppression. After the Iran-Iraq war, where the Kurds sided with Iran, Saddam Hussein destroyed entire Kurdish villages and used chemical weapons against the Kurdish people. Now, after all those years of struggle, the Kurds finally have military and administrative control over parts of Iraq and Syria. But the fighting in those countries isn't over yet, and stabilization, depending on who wins, may not be a good thing for Kurdish independence. Plus, the Kurds aren't just one united group looking to create an enormous Kurdish nation. They have numerous sub-factions and rifts. When you're talking about the Kurds in Iraq, you're talking about the Kurdistan regional government and their Peshmerga security forces. These are the people currently running the only autonomous region under Kurdish control. They're keeping the Kurds safe, and they have a record of assisting the U.S. with their war efforts in the area. The Peshmerga was the group that captured Saddam Hussein in 2003, and they also captured Osama bin Laden's messenger in 2004, which led to the eventual U.S. capture of Osama bin Laden. If you'd like to know more about the conflict in Iraq, click now. Okay. Wonderful. So it tells us a little bit about who these Kurds are, right? We can learn quite a bit about these folks in general. And so let's watch a second video here on the difficulties that Kurds have in creating this country of Kurdistan and why this is going to be so tough for them. All right. So let's go ahead and watch this in action. So the Kurds have been getting a lot of international attention in the last few years because of their role in the conflicts in Iraq and Syria. Kurdish militias have been battling ISIS, Syrian rebels, the Iraqi and Syrian governments to stake claim to land and to also protect Kurdish communities. In October 2017, Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan took part in a referendum in which 93% of those who voted chose independence. But the Iraqi government called the referendum illegal and non-binding. And while the referendum was considered a big moment in Kurdish political history, what happened in Iraqi Kurdistan didn't necessarily represent the direction of all Kurdish people. And Deniz Akici, a lecturer at UC Berkeley, breaks down why that's the case. There is no single Kurdish independence movement. After the World War I, Kurdistan was divided into four uh, nation states, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. So with that, let's roll back a bit and look at how the Kurds have ended up where they are today. The Kurds are the fourth largest ethnic group in the region and make up sizable minority populations across Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Despite having big numbers, they didn't get their own state after the fall of the Ottoman Empire when the United Kingdom and France were busy carving up the region. The infamous Sykes-Picot Agreement split the Ottoman Empire into nation states, but it didn't really care about how ethnically diverse the region actually was. The Kurds, left out of Sykes-Picot, had negotiated their own state under the Treaty of Sèvres, but that didn't work out. The treaty was supposed to split modern-day Turkey into different zones, including one for the Kurds. But it wasn't ratified, thanks to when Turkish nationalists led by Kemal Ataturk, Turkey's first president, recaptured all of modern Turkey from the Europeans. Fast forward to the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when we start seeing countries across the region gain independence from European colonialism. A huge part of pushing back against European colonialism was the cultivation of various nationalisms, Pan-Arabism for instance, Turkey's Kemalism, or Iranian nationalism. All of this meant that Kurdish sovereignty was either not a priority for Pan-Arabist leaders in Iraq and Syria, 
or was a threat for Kemalist Turkey and for Iran. That meant that over the 20th century, the Kurds across these four countries saw a lot of marginalization. There was displacement, political repression, loss of rights, and massacres. And it's not as though the Kurds didn't resist the repression. Time and time again, they did. Now, the brunt of the state violence faced by Kurds was in Turkey and Iraq. In Turkey, the government forcibly displaced over a million Kurds after several Kurdish revolts in the 1920s and 30s. Kurdish language and culture was banned, and violence against the Kurdish population, including torture and destruction of villages, was widespread. Kurds in Iraq saw the height of state repression in the late 80s and early 90s. Under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi government oversaw several massacres of Kurdish civilians during the Iran-Iraq war. The government accused Kurdish fighters along the Iranian border of assisting the Iranians and led what was called the Unfall Campaign. It lasted two years and claimed thousands of Kurdish lives by the end of the 1980s. Iraq in the 90s saw the first Gulf War, a Kurdish civil war, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi deaths as a result of the international sanctions. Then we get to the early 2000s, where there was the American invasion of Iraq. So that brings us now to today, a push for Kurdish independence and the resistance to it. Iraqi Kurdish journalist Abdullah Hawais told me how it's important to think of Kurdistan as more than just a political aspiration. So the idea of having a Kurdish state is not only a political dream, it's actually part of the culture of Kurds, it's part of their identity. They have been raised with thinking that Kurds deserve a state. So who's standing in the way? Let's start with Turkey and Iran. Iran and, and Turkey are very much uh, against the establishment of a Kurdish state, um, even outside of their borders, because they fear that if there is a Kurdish political entity anywhere in the Middle East, this would threaten the so-called national unity of these two countries. Turkey considers groups like the PKK, a.k.a. the Kurdistan Workers' Party, to be terrorist groups and threats to national security. Turkey also fears an independent Kurdish state in Iraq would be used as a base for the PKK to launch attacks on the Turkish military and civilian populations. Turkish nationalists see Kurdish aspirations inside its borders and outside as a threat to, well, Turkish state identity. Remember I mentioned how back in the 1930s, Kurds were barred in Turkey from speaking their own language and practicing their own culture? Well, it was only in 2012 that they were allowed to teach their own language and culture in private schools. Then there's Iran. Iran also has no interest in seeing an independent Kurdish state, given its own Kurdish population in the country's northwest, as well as its relationship with Iraq. Currently, Iran has very close relations with the Iraqi government, seeing it as a buffer between itself and hostile regional neighbors. A Kurdish state that would be seen as friendly to the United States and Israel isn't exactly the most tantalizing thought for the Iranians. Then we've got Iraq and Syria, both embroiled in conflict. Following the Kurdish referendum, the Iraqi government responded by launching an offensive to take the city of Kirkuk, which had been under Kurdish control since 2014. Kuwais, by the way, says that Kirkuk is central to Kurdish statehood. Kirkuk is considered a vital part of any Kurdish project for statehood, not only because of its uh, wealth and its oil, which is actually very important for, for any, any Kurdish state, especially economically, but also historically, Kurds think without Kirkuk, a Kurdish state would be very poor, even culturally. Then there's Syria, where Kurds have seen some reforms in recent years and where Kurdish forces have been integral in the battle against ISIS. In 2011, as protests were spreading across Syria, the government granted around 300,000 undocumented Kurds citizenship, citizenship that was stripped back in 1962. But Syria's Kurds are seeking a federal system in the country similar to Iraqi Kurdistan's autonomous position. As for the Americans, while they've supported... Okay, good stuff. So again, uh, we're seeing why Kurdistan is going to be tough for the Kurds to create. They have a lot of opposition from other states that are around them. And really, of course, these states argue that Kurdistan is going to weaken them. So why are they voluntarily going to give up land, territory, people, and resources to recreate a country that technically is making an ethnic minority in their country stronger? All right, um, so great example the Kurds. So Chechnya, uh, Kurdistan, both would be great examples for you to be able to use for stateless nations. Okay, multinational states. Hey, a multinational state is a state composed of more than one nationality, and probably the most famous is the United Kingdom. The, US, the UK, as it is known, is actually four different nationalities that have agreed to come together and cooperatively govern uh, while recognizing that in certain regions of their country, 
that nationality is dominant. So the four nationalities are English, and the areas that are pink in here on this map are the English-dominated areas. Wales, uh, and those areas are known as uh, dominated by the Welsh people. Um, Scotland, which is northern kind of England, uh, and then Ireland, or northern Ireland. And what you can see is each of these um, places originally started as their own kingdom, all right? And by the way, it shows you here, shaded on the map, where that kingdom uh, existed. So they were separate kingdoms originally, all right? Separate nationalities, uh, separate nation states, I guess you could say. But look what happens here. Uh, in 1536, England and Wales come together, and they form a multinational state together, all right, known as the Kingdom of England. Then they joined with Scotland uh, about 100 years later, and that became the Kingdom of Great Britain. Now we have three national nationalities co-governing together within one country. Uh, and then eventually, later on, they added Northern Ireland uh, to create the country of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. All right, so uh, four nationalities agreed to live together under one state and one national government. Uh, again, England, Wales, Scotland formed Great Britain, and later added North, Northern, Northern Ireland to create the United Kingdom. Another good example oh, of a multinational state is Yugoslavia. Now, whereas the United Kingdom, you know, this is a kind of a peaceful or a coexistent example of a multinational state, Yugoslavia is not. It's located in Southern Europe in a place known as the Balkan Peninsula. This area is a shatter belt. It's an area with tons of religious and ethnic differences all clashing together in this area. Muslims, Catholics, and uh, Orthodox Christians all live together. There has been historical conflict in this region, not just religiously, uh, but fighting between Middle Eastern countries coming up from the Middle East and European powers coming down. Oftentimes they met here to wage war. There's also a lot of irredentism here. This region has historically been controlled by Christians, by Muslims, uh, by not only Christians, but both Catholics and Orthodox Christians. And so as a result, all of those groups believe that their claims to this region are boosted by the history, by the irredentism. Uh, now, throughout much of the 1900s, uh, this country was a bunch of ethnicities just waiting to explode. They didn't because of a communist leader who lived there and ruled with an iron fist. His name was Marshal Tito. Uh, he ruled for about 40 years after World War II, and he kept, he kept control. He kept order. He cracked down on any nationalist movements. He cracked down on any ethnic movements. He used the military to keep these nationalities and ethnicities suppressed. But once he died, war and ethnic cleansing tore this region apart. It is an awesome example of devolution because we have one country, Yugoslavia, that breaks into seven different ones. Uh, it's also a specific type of devolution called Balkanization, named after this region, uh, where a country devolves by splitting specifically into smaller separate ones. All right, the book does an awesome job of explaining the incredibly horrific effects of uh, this conflict, uh, so make sure that you completed your ethnic chapter guide. Finally, autonomous or semi-autonomous territories or regions. An autonomous area is defined as an area of a country where the people have a degree of freedom to make their own decisions that's separate from the rest of the country. An autonomous region is typically an area that's kind of far away from the rest of the country or maybe it's populated by a national minority, so the country tends to give them a little bit more decision-making on their own to keep those that national minority happy. Hong Kong is probably the best example. It's under the control of China, but it used to belong to Britain. And the people in the Hong Kong are used to democratic government under Britain. So when China took over, they created, they turned Hong Kong into an autonomous region or area uh, in the hopes that the Hong Kong people would be less rebellious when they were under the control of the Chinese. This map here actually shows you green countries um, are countries where an autonomous region or area exists within that country. So a lot of places around the world use these as an effort, again, to keep otherwise maybe resistant people more loyal to the government. Um, the United States' best example are our Native American tribes. They are semi-autonomous regions. So again, uh, when we're looking at uh, Native American tribes in the United States, they are, uh, again, autonomous or semi-autonomous regions. 
Um, and, and here is actually a map. It's a list of Native American reservations in the continental United States. So within these areas, right, these Native tribes have uh, autonomous um, status, right? So uh, it's part of the reason why in some instances um, they are not subject to federal law uh, in those lands like other Americans would be where they live. All right, guys, probably the best example of an autonomous region or area is Hong Kong. Uh, again, it's under the control of China, but it used to belong to Britain. And the people there are used to British democracy. So when China took over in 2000, um, they gave those people in Hong Kong more autonomy than the rest of China has uh, in the hopes that it would keep them loyal to their new Chinese government. Um, it's actually, uh, if you know, uh, there's been a situation in Hong Kong that has erupted um, and uh, it has led to incredible conflict there between protesters and the government. And folks, we actually need to cover this as a great way of understanding devolution, uh, autonomous regions, really, to be honest with you, nationality, so many different concepts here. Uh, this video is a little long, right? But we're going to need to watch it as well. Again, you have an article here that you can read as well, but I highly recommend the video. Um, and the because we have all the way to the way. We have too many to the way. So we need to see the Hong Kong people. The people of Hong Kong are out in the streets. This is a journey to the Hong Kong. It can be the history of the Hong Kong people. Hundreds of thousands are demonstrating against a deeply unpopular bill. But this is about a whole lot more than a bill. It's about the status of Hong Kong and the power China has over it. It's a fight to preserve the freedoms people have here. And it all started with a murder. On February 8, 2018, a young couple, Chan Tong Kai and Poon Hyu Wing, went from their home in Hong Kong to Taiwan for vacation. They stayed at the Purple Garden Hotel in Taipei for nine days. But on February 17th, only one of them returned to Hong Kong. There, one month later, Chan confessed to murdering his girlfriend, who was pregnant at the time. But there was a problem. Hong Kong authorities couldn't charge him for murder because he did it in Taiwan. And they couldn't send him back to Taiwan to be charged because Hong Kong and Taiwan don't have an extradition agreement. So in 2019, Hong Kong's government proposed one. It would let them transfer suspects to Taiwan so they could be tried for their crimes. But the same bill would also allow extradition to mainland China. Where there's no fair trial, there's no humane... Uh, punishment, and uh, there's completely no uh, separation of powers. And that's what sparked these protests. China and Hong Kong are two very different places with a very complex political relationship, and the extradition bill threatens to give China more power over Hong Kong. See, Hong Kong is technically a part of China, but it operates as a semi-autonomous region. It all began in the late 1800s, when China lost a series of wars to Britain and ended up ceding Hong Kong for a period of 99 years. Hong Kong remained a British colony until 1997, when Britain gave it back to China under a special agreement. It was called One Country, Two Systems. It made Hong Kong a part of China, but it also said that Hong Kong would retain a high degree of autonomy, as well as democratic freedoms, like the right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, of assembly. And that made Hong Kong very different from mainland China, which is authoritarian. Citizens there don't have the same freedoms. Its legal system is often used to arrest, punish, and silence people who speak out against the state. But according to the agreement, one country, two systems wouldn't last forever. In 2047, Hong Kong is expected to fully become a part of China. The problem is, China isn't waiting for the deal to expire. Under the rule of Chinese leader Xi Jinping, 
pro-democracy leaders have already been arrested in Hong Kong, and mysterious abductions of booksellers have created a threat to free speech. But Hong Kong has been pushing back. In 2003, half a million Hong Kongers successfully fought legislation that would have punished speaking out against China. And in 2014, tens of thousands of protesters occupied the city for weeks to protest China's influence over Hong Kong's elections. Now, Hong Kongers are fighting the extradition bill because the bill is widely seen as the next step in China's encroachment on Hong Kong's autonomy. The sheer size of these protests shows you just how much opposition there is to this bill. But if Hong Kong's legislature votes on the bill, it'll probably pass. And that's because of the unique nature of Hong Kong's democracy. For starters, Hong Kong's people don't vote for their leader. The chief executive is selected by a small committee and approved by China. And even though they're the head of the government, they don't make the laws. That happens here. Like many democracies, Hong Kong has a legislature with democratically elected representatives. It's called the Legislative Council, or LegCo, and it has 70 seats. Within this system, Hong Kong has many political parties, but they are mostly either pro-democracy or pro-China. In every election, Hong Kong's pro-democracy and anti-establishment parties have won the popular vote, but they occupy less than half of the seats in the LegCo. This is because when Hong Kongers vote, they're only voting for these 40 of the 70 seats. The other 30 are chosen by the various business communities of Hong Kong. For example, one seat belongs to the finance industry, one seat belongs to the medical industry, one belongs to the insurance industry, and so on. Many of these 30 seats are voted on by corporations. And because big business has an incentive to be friendly with China, those seats are dominated by pro-China political parties. When Hong Kong was handed over to China in 1997, Hong Kong and China made an agreement that eventually all members of the council would be elected by the people. But that never happened. And ever since the handoff, pro-China parties have controlled the LegCo, despite having never won more than 50% of the popular vote. The way it's structured, they want to make sure that the executive branch can have easy control over it. And that would serve Beijing very well indeed. Within this unique structure, the extradition bill has created new tensions and fueled anger among pro-democracy politicians. And it's driven hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers into the streets. While this isn't Hong Kong's first protest against China's influence, it is the biggest. And many say this time is different because of the people involved. Professionals like lawyers and politicians are participating. Our legal sector staged the biggest ever protest parade. But it's young people who are at the forefront since they have the most to lose. They are the first generation born under one country, two systems, and in 28 years, when that arrangement ends, they'll be Hong Kong's professional class. I won't be around anymore. It's their future. It's their Hong Kong. They have every right to fight it. <laughs> The protests have convinced Hong Kong's government to suspend the bill. But that's not enough. Many want the bill withdrawn completely. That's because these protests are also part of a larger fight to push back against China's encroachment now, not just when time's up. So, 
自己原本擁有嘅權利去出嚟遊行咯。我哋仲有好多機會會改變。2047 is on its way, but it's not here yet. And until then, Hong Kongers still have a voice. History will tell whether we succeed. But even if we failed, history would say they did put up a fight and they didn't just take things lying down. And that's what we're trying to do too. Okay, excellent. So, hey, you must know this story as an awesome example of autonomous region, also as a, an example of devolution、uh, and centrifugal force. Make sure you use Hong Kong if you get an opportunity to do so. It's a perfect example for all of these. All right. Okay. Let's finish up with the slides now that we've watched our last video. All right. Uh, so remember, I showed you earlier that during,、uh, especially the 1800s,、um, there was a real decrease in the number of countries and the number of states that existed. That was because something became very popular in Europe、uh, between the 15 and the 1900s, known as colonialism.、Uh, and colonialism is when you try to acquire colonies.、Uh, that's a simple explanation. A、detailed one. It's when a state claims territory, and then they try to establish control over it. They try to exploit it, its people and its resources. They govern over it.、Uh, they administer it. It's called a colony.、Uh, so they have complete and total control over it, and they own it for the benefit of the mother country, not for the colony itself.、Uh, and then that state claims sovereignty over all social, government, and economic decisions in that territory. So the territory's there. The people and the resources are used by the state. Uh, but they really do not benefit from、um, the state like other citizens would.、Uh, there's an unequal relationship here in terms of political, social, and economic power. The state and its leaders have almost all of it. The colony has none, and the colony will often have leaders, but they are chosen by the state,、um, and they can be replaced any time by the state as well. So they're really just puppets of the state. Uh, when European states began to form under powerful monarchs in the 1400s, they would compete with each other for territory, for trade routes, and for overseas colonies.、Uh, and quite frankly, when it came to empire building, size mattered. All right, they were motivated to spread Christianity、um, around the rest of the world. Europeans were、uh, because, of course, they feel Christianity is threatened by Islam.、Uh, they wanted to gain wealth, resources, and glory for their country, and they wanted to gain political power, and that was measured in terms of the number of colonies you had. Now, England, France, Spain, Holland, Portugal—they're the earliest. They're the largest colonizers. They started way back in 1500. The major Europeans:、uh, Japan, Italy, U.S., Germany, and Russia—they all developed later on、uh, and continue to colonize into the 1900s as well. So a lot of different European and North American and the United States, right, and Japan as well, eventually,、um, really ended up creating these huge colonial empires. Hey, thinking,、uh, speaking of empire,、uh, that takes us to the term imperialism,、um, and、uh, it's it's pretty close to colonialism. It's kind of just the next level. I want you to think of like a parent-child relationship. All right. Parents tend to make most decisions in the interests of the children, whether the child thinks that's the case or not. It's very similar to imperialism.、Uh, it's the creation and/or maintenance of an unequal economic, cultural, and territorial relationship in the form of an empire, so multiple colonies, and it is based on domination by the state and complete dependence on the state by all territories. So imperialism is really colonialism turned into an empire that stretches over a large part of the world. All resources in the colony go back to support the people and the economy of the state, the mother country. The colony, like a child, has no political control over its affairs. Basically, works and produces goods for the benefit of the state. The state defends the colony like it's its own land, and the people get access to all the products produced by the state,、uh, but they really do not enjoy the rights or the benefits like other、um, citizens would. Europe created empires first, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundreds, made up of colonies, and then as time went by,、uh, these colony, these empires stretched into Africa, they stretched into Asia,、uh, and of course they existed in the Americas, North and South as well. Eventually, one colony that was part of an empire, the American colonies, right, part of the British Empire. Become their own country, and then they do the same thing and start creating an empire of their own in the Atlantic and the Pacific. All right. Also, 
Colonialism led and imperialism led to a lot of conflict, a lot of wars, a lot of fighting over these possessions. And oftentimes these wars spread back into Europe as well. You want to look at why there's a uh, historic differences between a lot of countries in Europe, uh, why there's rivalries, why there's conflict, why some European countries tend to have a lot more wealth than others. Um, it has to do with imperialism um, and the impact that it had on the development of Europe. Uh, and look at this map of 1900. Look at these empires. All right, I already showed you one earlier, but do you notice there are much, there are far fewer colors in in the world here, um, and the size of countries' boundaries have expanded. This is the height of imperialism, right at the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and you can see what we mean here with France again as an example, and of course the best example always is uh, Great Britain, the United Kingdom. All righty. Uh, here And as a result of this empire building, um, I love to really focus in on Britain because they're the best example. They truly had a worldwide empire. Um, and, you know, the saying was the sun never sets on the British Empire because at some point in the world, the sun was shining on a possession that was owned by the United Kingdom. Um, think of how impressive it is for them to control all of this land, uh, for them to be able to conquer it and, you know, uh, hold on to it. Also think of how impossible it would be to manage all of these possessions all over the world at the same time. And you start to see why over time the British begin to lose these possessions or begin to voluntarily grant independence to some of them, usually because they just could not physically hold on to all of them uh, indefinitely. Uh, let's take a look at the effects of imperialism, and we want to look at Africa especially. Um, Africa was really the, the, the place in the world that was truly carved up the most by Europeans. Uh, they met in Germany, in the capital of Germany, Berlin, in 1884, and they divided Africa up, up amongst themselves. So, you know, the British get a piece, the French get their piece, right? Italy gets some, Germany gets some, the Dutch get a little bit here. Um, everybody got their chunk, all right? Here's the thing. No Africans were involved in this process. There wasn't a single African in the room. There was no regard taken by the Europeans for basic cultural traits like language, ethnicity, religion. Uh, and so what they did was they created a map that served Europe and they ignored every cultural aspect uh, that existed in Africa. Folks, on the left here is a tribal map of Africa. It shows you the various tribes and where they are located. Do you see there are literally thousands of them? In some of these areas in West Africa, there are literally hundreds and even thousands of ethnicities living in very close proximity to one another. You would think that Europeans would have taken language and ethnicity and religion into account when drawing these boundaries to make this, the uh, Africa run more smoothly. No, they didn't. They drew these lines arbitrarily based on what they uh, valued, where the resources were. Oftentimes, um, they just drew straight lines because they had no knowledge of who or what existed there. Folks, as a result of this, it leads to decades of conflict between African tribes and later countries, conflicts that lead to war, instability, and it also leads to a great deal of poverty. Uh, because certain regions and areas uh, really ha ended up with a great deal more wealth than others. All right. Hey, not only did Europeans ignore what was best for Africans, and by the way, this is the, what they created, Europe. Look at this, right? Take a look at that map and then create it, uh, compare it to the ethnicity map. There's just no comparison. Uh, they completely ignored every aspect of it when they partitioned or divided up Africa. When they divided it up again, uh, they ignored what was best for Africans when it came to natural resources. They also created boundaries that ignored physical obstacles, population distribution, the economics, the cultural features. Like I said, they would often just draw a straight line on the map without really knowing who or what was there, just out of ease. As a result, a, a lot of tribes' ethnicities in Africa were divided amongst many states, many countries. Oftentimes, hostile tribes, rivals, were forced to live together now within the same country and govern together despite being mortal enemies. Some groups have a lot of natural resource, wealth, and power. Others uh, had none. We see stateless nations all over Africa as a result of this. We see multinational states all over Africa. And really, who is responsible for all of this? Europe and imperialism. 
Um, and folks, it really has stunted and slowed the development of Africa all the way up to today compared to other regions that didn't experience this. Shoot, folks, after World War II, most of the European countries began to realize, hey, um, empire building is not going to work for us forever. And so after World War II, as ideas of democracy and self-determination gained more popularity worldwide, a lot of imperialist countries voluntarily gave up their empires, or they were pressured to by the United States and other democracies, or they physically lost those colonies or converted them to more permanent and legally recognized parts of their empire. This period after World War II is known as decolonization, when colonial empires were gotten rid of. And it took place across most of the world, but it especially took place in Africa and Asia because that's where most of the colonies still existed in, up until 1950. By the 50s and 60s, most of those former colonies had gained their independence from the mother country. It's the biggest reason why there are so many more countries today um, than there were in 1900 or even before that. Now, just so you know, even though colonization has ended, there is an idea out there known as neocolonialism, and that means new colonialism, and that's the idea that, that LDCs, right, former colonies, are really pretty much totally still completely dependent on the mother state. Even if the state no longer claims sovereignty, political control, they still uh, essentially dominate their colonies economically. Um, that colony depends exclusively oftentimes on the state still for trade, um, and, you know, corporations that are located there are corporations that are based in the state. Uh, and so even though colonialism is over, these small countries um, and these places in Africa and Asia are still totally dependent on the, um, the original colonial state. Uh, one last thing. Hey, even when the Europeans finally decolonized, they still managed to screw it up and cause a bunch of problems. I want to give you two examples. One... Let's go to the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East was completely controlled by Britain until World War I, and then they decolonized much of that region. Uh, they did so by issuing something called the Balfour Declaration. Uh, but since they didn't really know how to fairly split up the land and the ethnicities, you know, it's such a mess, it's complicated, it's confusing, they decided to do what was easiest for them. They drew arbitrary lines across the Middle East. And what they did was they created some countries that were very rich, ended up ended up having a lot of oil, others that are incredibly impoverished, right? No natural resources. Some divided um, races and ethnicities, others united them. Uh, and as a result, certain countries in the Middle East have developed at a much smoother rate than others. Uh, many of these decisions have helped shape Middle Eastern conflicts today. They most certainly have helped to shape uh, the conflict between Shia and Sunni Islam in the Middle East. My final example here, uh, the British screwed it up elsewhere. They screwed it up in India, too. Uh, when they withdrew from India in Pakistan in the 1950s, they created new national boundaries. Um, but they were in such a hurry to leave, they basically ignored religious differences along the border. Um, and they ignored where people were located. And they basically just drew boundaries that said, okay, all Muslims on this side, all Hindus on the other. What that did was it caused, it forced millions and millions of people to have to relocate to their new country against their will. So former Pakistanis had to relocate to India and vice versa. Otherwise, they risked being targeted by their new government, right, uh, or um, the hostile religions around them that existed in that country. All right, folks, so decolonization, a good thing. Right. But colonization is so messy and complicated that even when you decolonize, it often leads to a bunch of problems in that region, just as much as colonization did to begin with. OK, Mr. M signing out here, folks. Thank you for staying with me on this. Uh, I hope this was beneficial and get your work done.